Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CNCF End User Lounge, where we explore how cloud native technologies are adopted by end user organizations across different industries and sectors. Just as a reminder, the CNCF End User Community is formed of more than 150 vendor neutral organizations that use open source tooling to deliver their product. My name is Katie Gamanji, and currently I am the ecosystem advocate at CNCF. And today with me, I have Stephen Chan and Sunil Shah from Airbnb. Thanks for having us. Thank yeah. you for being here. So in these live streams, we bring end user members to showcase how their organizations navigate cloud native ecosystem to build and distribute their services and products. Join us every fourth Thursday at 9 a.m. PT. Just as a reminder, this is an official live stream of CNCF as such subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Pretty much, please be respectful to all of the fellow participants and presenters. If you have any questions for us, we'll be monitoring them throughout the stream. So make sure to ask your questions in the live stream chat. And as mentioned today, I have Stephen and Sunil from Airbnb. And we're gonna discuss how Airbnb manages a dense service oriented architecture of thousands of services across dozens of clusters. Now, before we jump into some of the questions, um, Steven, Sunil, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Sure. Um, so I've been uh, working at Airbnb for the past um, three and a half years. And so um, I've had the opportunity to uh, work on two different teams working with cloud native technologies. Uh, first one is uh, our compute info team, which manages the operations and uh, scalability uh, performance and so on of our Kubernetes clusters, as well as uh, tooling on top of them, like how we generate manifests and how we integrate with the uh, existing infrastructure. Um, and then the second team, which I'm currently on, is our service mesh team, which is building out um, you know, the next generation of how services are observable, um, how they are secured and how they discover each other. Cool. Uh, yeah, my name is Sunil. I manage the computer infra team at Airbnb. So I've been here around 18 months. Um, <clears throat> prior to that, I did a very similar thing at Yelp, but we used Mesos. Um, and prior to that, I worked at a company called Mesosphere, which uh, developed the open source Apache Mesos project. So um, Kubernetes is kind of new to me since I came to Airbnb, um, but I'm very familiar with the, the idea of container orchestration. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the team is really focused on, on making Kubernetes the de facto compute platform at Airbnb. Nice. I'm actually quite excited to hear more of the work your teams um, are doing at Airbnb. And the first question I'd like to start with is, could you tell us more about your platform or infrastructure setup, but more importantly, why cloud native tools are a cornerstone in creating and shipping your services? Sure, so I can uh, talk to a little bit about that. Um, I think in order to get a good sense of um, our current setup, I can talk about our, our journey here uh, from you know the very beginning of Airbnb. So back in you know, 2008, Airbnb started out as um, a single monolithic Ruby on Rails app running in a single um, AWS account. Uh, and that worked uh, very well, you know, for early days and launching lots of features. And then as the team grew and, you know, the company grew in terms of users, we naturally had to start um, splitting things up, right? So that um, we had um, a lot of tooling that started out dedicated um, to just this kind of monolithic app. We had a separate deploy app. Um, we configured the hosts, which ran their application with Chef. Um, and then this didn't scale so well uh, as we split up into an SOA. So users had to end up you know, going into multiple different repos to change their configuration. Uh, they had to each like deploy each repo in a different way, deploy that configuration. Uh, it was kind of error prone. Um, they also had to manage their own hosts, right? And 
not everyone is um, comfortable doing that. Not all teams were comfortable doing that. Uh, and so we wanted to reach for kind of a more centralized solution, um, something that um, allowed users to deploy their code and configuration in the same repository, the same way. Uh, we didn't want them to, uh, you know, create cloud resources uh, by hand in the console anymore. Um, and so we started looking for, you know, what are the tools that we can use to, um, to help us achieve these goals. And one of the early tools that we reached for was uh, Kubernetes. Um, and so this was about in um, 2016. Um, you know, there were many iterations in between, but um, I'll start with uh, Kubernetes. Um, so what Kubernetes does is it lets us um, integrate really well with our existing infrastructure. So like previously we had, like I mentioned, users had to go into one repo to you know, configure their hosts, one repo to, um, configure their alerts and their dashboards and so on. And so for, uh, we built a abstraction on top of Kubernetes called OneTouch. And that um, allows users to have this uh, folder called like underscore infra in their application repo. And under underscore infra, there's um, a few files. One of them is called, um, Kubegen, and so it's just a, a YAML file, um, which where it allows users to configure things like the uh, services that they'll need to discover, um, their CPU and memory requests, and so on, and that gets generated into Kubernetes manifests. Um, and there's also um, files on the underscore infra folder, like uh, alerts, which allow you to um, they, they become transformed into custom resources. Um, and that, that integrates well, because when we deploy all our um, the Kubernetes manifest and the custom resources, um, then we have a custom controller, which listens and then um, kind of makes sure that our alerts provider is synced up uh, with the definition that users have. And so, there's a, a lot of a lot more things that we can dive deeper into, but that's kind of a whirlwind overview of some of the, the pieces that we, we went into. It's really great, actually. Um, you've mentioned that the previous state of infrastructure didn't really allow for scale or even to have a manageable way to deploy your services. So that's definitely one of the, um, I've seen in the past that this has been quite a core motivation uh, for um, end user companies to move to cloud native. Um, now you've been mentioning Kubernetes that you use in your platform, but you've mentioned when you introduce yourself that you are involved with the service mesh team. So could you please maybe touch upon some of the other technologies used in addition to Kubernetes, maybe um, what you're using for, for logging or, for authentication, if you're allowed to say that. So maybe some a bit of like our core parts that you use in your platform. Sure. Um, yeah, so I mentioned Kubernetes a lot, but for um, deploys, we're using um, Spinnaker for service mesh. We're building on top of um, Istio. And then uh, for our logging stack, we're making a lot of use of um, uh, the Elk stack. And for, um, I'll talk mostly about our internal services service like authentication. So um, in our service mesh, um, Istio comes with uh, Spiffy, right? Which is um, a kind of authentication framework and allows uh, all of our services to communicate through TLS. This is actually great. I'm, I'm really excited to hear that Spiffy is actually used uh, in an organization. And why I'm saying that is we had a secret management radar, which was in the, in the previous quarter, and we didn't have Spiffy or Aspire on, on the radar, mainly because it's still emerging technologies. 
So it's really great to hear that an organization like Airbnb already integrates it to have this secure communication between services. Now, you're talking about OneTouch and the first time I, I heard about OneTouch and this abstraction you have on top of Kubernetes was during uh, KubeCon North America in 2018. So that was in Seattle a long time ago. It feels like a very long time ago now. So uh, you've mentioned that this is an abstraction that helps your developers to deploy services. Um, but I would like to ask a question of um, how it actually impacts the maintenance of your clusters and services. Like, is it easier for you to deploy changes or even completely um, uh, roll out a service or delete a service? And um, another question I have in regards to this, does it, how does it uh, impact the immutability of your infrastructures and clusters? Sure. Yeah, so I'll talk about um, how we can move services between clusters a little bit. So uh, I mentioned earlier that you know, in the, each application or service repository, there's the infra folder and there's the inside of the infra folder, there's a uh, kubegen configuration file. Um, and so the structure of the kubegen file is that there's uh, multiple environments for the app. So you might have the production, development, and staging uh, environments. And in each of those environments, there's one single YAML field called um, context. And context is basically the cluster that this um, environment gets uh, deployed to. And so the when, when our uh, kubegen CLI uh, reads in the kubegen file, it, it generates out all the, all the manifests and then uh, then during deploy time, uh, that context is, is checked and then um, sends it all those manifests to the correct cluster. So instead of you know, having to like, specify the cluster multiple times, just have that single field. And so we can, um, because the kubegen um, file is also just plain YAML, it makes it easy to uh, run automated refactors across these service repositories where you can change the, the context of the environment. So you can uh, almost automatically move services between clusters. Uh, first, you can deploy to the new cluster uh, and then gradually scale down to um, the service in the old cluster. And we can also even run um, automated canary analysis. So we run like one replica in the new cluster, one replica in the old cluster, um, and they both receive production traffic. Uh, and then you can compare to make sure that um, the service is uh, running normally on the new cluster before migrating the rest over. Um, and so um, this, like in practice, we're not moving services, like we're not rotating through clusters like every single day because we're running you know, tens or hundreds of services uh, in a given cluster. But what this lets us do is when we're doing um, some you know, more challenging migrations, like when we're switching our CNI provider uh, or CNI uh, plugin, then we can create a new cluster with the new CNI plugin um, and then uh, move our services over kind of you know, one by one and then gradually like spin down the old cluster. And so it makes these kind of um, transitions of like cluster setup go from something that's really risky with a large plus radius to something that we can, we can do gradually. Now this sounds really, really cool because migrating between clusters, especially, it seems like it's in an automatic fashion as well. It, it's challenging, but it seems like you already have the processes built in house to, to allow, this, allow this kind of operations. And another question I have, which is gonna be next, is on developer experience, which is gonna be tied into how these services are delivered. Now with Airbnb, um, well, one of the talks that I've seen is pretty much, uh, it was mentioning that you've migrated from managing hundreds of services to hosting thousands of them in less than three years. And I would like to maybe question how this impacted the developer experience and maybe do you have like new methodologies to troubleshoot, maintain, debug an application when something is going wrong there? Sure. Yeah, so the you know, journey of uh, building out that SOA was a 
pretty massive one over multiple years. I think back in like 2015, um, that's when we really started that effort in earnest. Um, and as I mentioned, we were exploring Kubernetes around that, that time as well. Um, so basically at that time, we knew that there would be lots of services that needed to be created and, and maintained. And no one knew how, exactly how many, but our, our goal was um, to initially to allow service owners to create a production ready service in, in just one hour. And this um, required a lot of that consolidation efforts that I talked about at, at the beginning, which is like um, moving from having um, like multiple tools repositories that service owners had to, to um, edit and deploy uh, into one single application. So that's why we, we call it uh, one touch because it's just one, one place, right? To, to host all your, your code and configuration. Um, and you were mentioning the, the second part of your question, right? Could you remind me about um, that? So this is pretty much uh, the developer experience that you've covered so far. And I'm curious if, for example, as an engineer, I'm using OneTouch to deploy my application. But what is the process if I would like to troubleshoot it? Or maybe verify if it's running in the right clusters with the right amount of pods, if I can get the logs. Like, what are those troubleshooting procedures internally? Got it. Yeah, so um, for that, we have a command line tool. Just It's called K, um, which is you know similar to a lot of people's aliases for um, kubectl. But in this case, um, it's our own CLI that wraps around um, a lot of common workflows that you mentioned, like um, execing into a, a pod for interactive debugging or like uh, removing it from service discovery uh, for that kind of interactive debugging while making sure that it's deleted later, checking the logs. Um, and some of the um, different, like the reason why we have this is because we want a more kind of like application centric uh, focus on, on the CLI. So some of the arguments that you can provide to it are like the app and the environment. Um, and then we derive the namespace from that by concatenating the app and the environment together. No, that's really cool. I'll, I would definitely like to try try that out. Do you, uh, by any chance, do you maybe have a version which is open source and open source and the uh, listeners can, uh, can verify by themselves or they just have to uh, inspire themselves from, um, from what you've been telling so far? Uh, we've been talking about that for um, a little while and, and considering it. Um, so, you know, do you have any um, insight into the current thoughts on that? For OneTouch or, or the K-Tool? Um, the K-Tool. Yeah, we haven't really um, pushed forwards on that because I think a, there's a lot of duplication between K and kubectl and a lot of that, the, the sort of functionality it provides is very specific to how Airbnb, like, you know, how we, how we manage namespaces, how we manage applications. Um, and so there's a little bit of like proprietary stuff there. Um, I know we have spoken in the past about making elements of OneTouch uh, open source, although I suspect the industry has moved forward since, um, because I think at the time it was a relatively novel way to manage application resources. Um, so we'd love to, um, but uh, yeah, not not a huge amount of progress yet. And I think, well, um, I think yeah. uh, so another, um, you know, there, there are other different ways that, that kubectl now allows you to, to integrate, which is like with kubectl plugins, um, which, which are like another good way of adding your own workflows around it. Um, initially this, this started as kind of like scripting around kubectl, um, but now we've also got like many, like since it's a full-fledged uh, CLI, we, we've got plenty of other workflows. For example, we also use K to allow developers to get access to their, um, Kubernetes clusters to you know, get their authentication credentials. Cool. 
I wanted to mention before that if there are still any kind of uh, intentions to open source that, I think the community is going to look forward to, to these tools because I think there are so many organizations that are still at the beginning of the journey to adopt cloud native. I think this is definitely going to be useful to, to, some, um, to some sectors. And you've mentioned kubectl plugins. I think, again, this is a great way to uh, personalize and tailor the way you consume kubectl commands and the way you interact with your cluster. So definitely kind of um, a great usage uh, at Airbnb. And it's great to hear about this one. Um, another point I wanted to make about the developer experience, which is a bit maybe less technical. Um, being developer centric um, is quite important. It definitely uh, enables of course, the power with the engineering team to deploy their services. But I would like to ask if having a good developer experience maybe impacted the culture internally at Airbnb, maybe some of the practices, or maybe did it had uh, any changes in recruiting the top talent? Like, do you think this impacted these areas in any way? Yeah, I think, um, like I mentioned, that um, one of the benefits of separating out uh, the, the management of infrastructure and uh, product teams is that there's a there's the uh, ability to specialize right so um, if you're on a you know, product team or a service owner you can um, now you can more confidently deploy your changes to to production um, and because we have a more um, homogeneous and, and managed infra um, and there's less time that's required for you know, firefighting and um, distractions on reliability issues. Um, and so that allows our, our product teams to achieve a, a better velocity. I think the reliability story is really interesting too, because one of the benefits of like the reason organizations move to a microservices uh, based architecture is because it really helps your engineering team scale, right? Like Airbnb has, I think at this point, thousands of engineers. And the monolithic application, I think wasn't working well at, at the time, uh, just because of the velocity of work that people were doing. And so we moved to the service oriented architecture, but maintaining a common standard for how we want these applications to be operationalized, like how we do alerting, how we manage services in production, how we auto scale things. One of the big benefits of OneTouch for Airbnb was that we were able to enforce these common standards across all applications Then we had one central place to introduce changes. So then things like upgrading dependencies are a little bit easier because I mean, harder in some ways because there are many applications to upgrade at a time, but we also had a central way to kind of make sure all the services are moving forward in one step. Um, and kind of meeting our latest standards. Um, and that's been pretty powerful, I think, um, because you know, most of our services run on Kubernetes, almost all of them, and I think almost all of them are now auto-scaled or right-sized in some way, um, which is really, really helpful when it comes to, you know, adapting to changing load. Um, you know, 1st of January, <clears throat> is a busy day for Airbnb because people like booking vacations. And, and so, you know, the clusters just, the tooling takes care of that for us. We don't need to worry about it. Um, and I think that's a big part of our like maturity as an engineering organization. Oh, that's really cool. Um, thank you for giving like a, such a full introduction of your clusters and the deployment process to, to the platform. Um, another question I have, uh, it's more about the future challenges. So do you feel like um, at this point, there are any um, challenges that you're going to face in building your clusters or maintaining your clusters or deploying your applications? Or maybe there are some new technologies that you'd like to adopt and they are on your radar at the moment. Yeah, so um, some of our current challenges are uh, around uh, how we deploy services to like multiple clusters and rethinking some of our fault domains. So right now, um, all of our clusters run across uh, multiple uh, availability zones uh, and we deploy one single um, service environment to, to one cluster. Um, and so what that means is that the, the cluster right now is still the um, fault domain for a particular service environment. Um, and so uh, we want to rethink a little bit of, about that um, because uh, one of the problems we've seen with um, running 
clusters across multiple zones is uh, balancing replicas actually across the, the zones evenly. Um, and with you know, things like um, topology spread constraints, um, that's become a little bit easier, um, but we still want to maintain a really even capacity in case um, you know our underlying cloud provider loses some like some capacity in a given availability zone, or also to um, avoid uh, you know, traffic going between those zones. Um, and so we're thinking about you know how can we restructure these clusters? Could we maybe one run one cluster in a single availability zone? Um, and then deploy a service to like a uh, service environment to uh, multiple clusters. But then uh, in order to do that, we need to have a, a strong idea of our federation story. So how are we going to um, abstract away the underlying set of clusters from users and allow them to maybe just specify some of the constraints, like maybe they would like to run on one set of uh, hardware, um, but they don't have to worry about whether it's going to, you know, prod A or prod B or prod C. Now, again, like, um, sounds really exciting and hopefully going to share some of these thoughts when you actually implement it uh, during mm -hmm. different talks and sessions at KubeCon. And um, the next section that I, the next set of questions that I have are, of course, around uh, your KubeCon and Cloud Native Con participation because Airbnb in the past have given many talks and uh, even keynotes um, uh, during KubeCon. So uh, the keynote that I was talking about and uh, refers to to OneTouch, we've covered this quite um, quite heavily in the in the first section of the stream. However, there is one talk that you've delivered, Stephen, um, which is "Did Kubernetes Make My P95 Spores?" Now. Could you share uh, Airbnb's journey on performance gains and losses and, and its mass migration to Kubernetes? Sure. Yeah. So, um, you know, that's one of the uh, one of the challenges that came with making sure that all of our existing services adopted Kubernetes as well as our, our new ones was making sure that um, developers had a good sense of whether their application was running faster or slower. Um, when migrating. And then um, we also encounter lots of like interesting performance regressions, which we uh, shared in that talk. Um, and so some of the um, gains that we saw in terms of performance were, um, some of them were around like efficiency of resource usage. So, you know, we had more uniform provisioning because of the, the bin packing that we were able to do. We were able to um, you know, we're able to enforce um, a certain percentage of resources are actually being used on the nodes and then uh, auto scale up our, the number of nodes in our cluster when we hit say like 85% um, utilization where, where I define utilization as the, all the requests uh, of the pods for like their CPU and memory compared to the uh, CPU memory offered by all the minions. And so um, you can compare this to like previously when service teams were in charge of their own, their own hosts, uh, not all of the services were, were auto scaled. So this led to like some pretty inconsistent provisioning. You know, some, some services were massively over provisioned and others like when traffic increased a small amount, they would, uh, have to rapidly scale up, um, and so um, that's that's one of the things that we we got, uh, which was the central control over uh, how we're composing our fleet and how we're how we're bin packing. Um, and then we can also uh, upgrade all of our like hardware to you know, latest generation, um, which again, was not possible uh, with each individual team managing their, their, their hosts. So that's an easy win. Um, and then um, for some of the, the losses, right? Because we're, we're running multi-tenant, uh, we've got interference. So we had to do a lot of research with regards to 
CPU limits and uh, latencies, for example, is it better to set a CPU limit equal to the request, set like a really high CPU limit or uh, no limit at all? And currently we're not recommending that uh, users set CPU limits, um, but we still wanna alert on utilization relative to their, their requests. Now, this is like a very short overview of what Steven uh, shared here. Um, we will try to point to the actual talk as well, uh, which was uh, given at KubeCon. And another session that I want to mention, and scaling has been mentioned quite heavily today throughout the entire uh, discussion. And one of the talks that was given was uh, scaling Kubernetes to thousands of nodes across multiple clusters calmly. Now, this is, I think, quite an important characteristic of um, uh, managing clusters because when you scale, when you uh, increase the amount of infrastructure you have to manage, usually calmly is not something you, uh, you would introduce in that situation. So within this talk, um, pretty much it describes how Airbnb scaled from 600 Kubernetes clusters to five, uh, 600 nodes um, to 5,000 nodes and uh, tens of clusters. Um, maybe could you briefly share how, um, uh, how you kind of completed this migration, maybe some of the challenges that were faced during this migration, any specific approaches that you could recommend to the listeners, pretty much everything in this context. So yeah, a lot of this uh, talk was motivated around our, our journey from running uh, one single uh, production cluster, which is like our initial attempt into breaking that into uh, dozens of clusters. So you know, we learned a lot of things about um, cluster scalability uh, with that first approach that I mentioned, like we had to um, understand, you know, etcd scalability, um, uh, like events, um, like scheduler, uh, algorithm efficiency, like some cube DNS issues, and uh, lots of lots more. So we've shared some of those uh, stories individually in other talks, like um, the. Um, the talk of did Kubernetes make my P95s worse, as well as um, a kind of a series of talks that we've got called like, ways to blow up your, your Kubernetes cluster. Uh, and so, yeah, pretty much uh, pretty early on um, when we were migrating our services over, we, we realized that we would need multiple production clusters. Um, but, but because of that initial experience, we had good guidelines around um, how big to make each production cluster. So um, currently we have, we run each cluster capped around 1000 nodes. And then we have other limits on things like pod update rates and uh, like endpoints per service. And we follow the guidelines from the six scalability pretty closely. Um, and another, like besides uh, scalability of our clusters, um, we also touched in this talk on uh, provisioning uh, automation and, and speed. So our first clusters were set up in the style of kind of like Kubernetes the hard way. So very um, hand rolled. Uh, and so for creating many clusters, we we're looking to raise the level of abstraction. So we looked through you know, some of the uh, existing projects at the time for bootstrapping clusters like um, COPS and uh, Cube ADM. Um, so ultimately we decided to uh, create APIs that were inspired by these projects. And then we wrote uh, scripts underneath that um, generated our own configuration. Um, so that allowed us to uh, integrate with our existing um, VM management infra. And so some of the key ideas um, from that talk are one uh, that you wanna have an API to describe your cluster state, which uh, is you know, still evolving in the community. And then two, we want to group similar clusters into a uh, cluster type. And uh, cluster type just means like common configuration that doesn't really differ across multiple clusters. And so in the future, we're hoping to draw some analogy lines between, for example, how um, replica sets specify like the number of clusters and deployment manage uh, rollouts of cluster changes. So you can actually imagine changing that API into um, some sort of resource that, uh, some sort of custom resource that allows for smooth rollout of new, new changes across multiple clusters. 
sounds like operators are still a driving force when it comes to maybe day two or even day three Kubernetes. So again, if, you, if you're going to build something around this, actually, the talks that already have been delivered in this topic, they, they have great contents. So I definitely would uh, like to encourage everyone to watch those. And if there's uh, maybe further work on this, definitely be great to hear about it. Now, going back to KubeCon Cloud Native Con North America this year, uh, maybe Sunil can have some inputs here as well, in addition to Stephen. What are you looking most forward to explore during KubeCon, which is going to happen in uh, three months? Yeah, I can uh, share one thing. Um, so um, you know, we're at this point now where Airbnb is running almost all stateless services on Kubernetes. Um, and I guess the, the, the infrastructure team at Airbnb is getting really excited about running stateful things on Kubernetes, um, especially as we start thinking about how we manage um, our infrastructure at a large scale, like different regions, different um, availability zones, so on. And so we're really interested in, in how we can onboard stateful services. Um, you know, this is things like online, offline databases, um, other distributed systems, things like Kafka. So people have started doing this in the industry, um, but now it feels like people, you know, other companies are starting to reach the stage where they're running these things in production. So um, one of the things we're really interested in, in learning more about uh, how people are running stateful services on Kubernetes and any, you know, how we do that in a reasonable way um, and a safe way um, at Airbnb scale. I can also mention that um, from the service mesh side of things, we're interested in um, some of those recent efforts on the part of um, Kubernetes. So like there are you know, native Kubernetes resources that are uh, in works to enable easier integration with service mesh, like um, multi-cluster, uh, services, for example. Um, so, you know, initial service mesh efforts, they, they kind of piggybacked on existing resources like services and endpoints, but um, hopefully the two um, efforts can meet each other um, a little bit. Uh, and then we're looking forward to the, the efforts that the community has, has worked towards for that. It's really cool to hear about this one. Um, I think there's like definitely new uh, collocated days uh, during KubeCon and some of them are gonna be focused on managing data and maybe some of them uh, uh, can be quite insightful into managing stateful applications. And another cool topic that uh, Stephen mentioned, of course, is how can, you how can you use service mesh across multiple clusters and actually make sure that the services in different clusters communicate between themselves securely. And maybe taking a step away from Airbnb and uh, taking the, uh, the hat from like Airbnb hat and putting the community hat here. Um, what kind of predictions you have in regards to emerging themes and technologies within the wider uh, ecosystem? And this can be completely unrelated to your current work at Airbnb, maybe something you're excited to, to know more about or to see developing in the community. Yeah, so um, one of the things I'm personally excited about is learning uh, or watching identity and authorization projects uh, grow and, and gain more adoption. So for example, you know, uh, Open Policy Agent recently graduated from CNCF and there's uh, more, more adoption uh, that it's seeing. Uh, and I'm excited to see how that's going to be used, not just as a admission controller or for like service, service authorization, but as a component that um, people use for general policy enforcement across all their infrastructure projects. And um, on the identity side of things, I'm looking to, forward to seeing how uh, Spiffy and Inspire can see widening adoption across the stack, not just for service to service authentication, but also maybe like, like user authentication and access to services or infrastructure. If you could, if we could use some of these projects and extend them to allow um, like SSH permissions or other things like that. So Neil, do you have maybe your insights into emerging themes within the cloud native ecosystem? Yeah, um, I, I'm a little out of touch with the community, but um, I know there are a set of startups that are looking at this idea of uh, run books as code, um, which I find kind of interesting. Um, the idea about you know using tooling to augment your on-call engineers um, 
ability to investigate issues with clusters. Um, that seems really powerful to me because, you know, at a company like Airbnb, we have a large engineering team and it's not really sustainable for our team to be involved in every incident to do with a service having, um, you know, issues. And so um, anything we can do to kind of programmatically enrich data that goes to um, users is really helpful. Um, so that's a direction I'm really interested in. Um, you know, there's lots of challenges there because in order to do that well, you have to integrate with a lot of different um, providers and systems, um, but, um, and, you know, permissions and like where you host this data is really kind of interesting and confusing. But um, yeah, I think that's something that has um, a lot of potential to make on call a lot easier um, for, for people managing lots of clusters. No, I'm definitely curious to see uh, this area is growing uh, within within the, um, the the ecosystem as well. And the last set of questions I have is in regards to your uh, experience as an end user. Now, Airbnb is a CNCF end user member uh, quite recently, actually. They joined uh, a couple of uh, weeks ago. And I know it hasn't been uh, too much, but still, I'd like to ask uh, about your experience of being a CNCF um, end user and your experience with uh, communicating or uh, reaching out to the community, adopting tooling, and so forth. Yeah, so um, I think in general, the, the community has been uh, really accommodating and, and welcoming. And so like project maintainers are always ready to discuss our requirements uh, and, and any issues that we, we bring up. Um, and you know, if they um, feel like, a, for example, like we raise a request and they, they think that it's better to be fulfilled outside of the project or like it's not likely to be prioritized in the near future, they can communicate that as well and then we can work together to either find you know, some extension mechanism or um, know that, that we're going to build our, our in-house solution uh, for the time being as well. Um, yeah, Sunil, do you have any thoughts on experience as end users? Yeah, it's been pretty great so far. Um, I think I'm really excited to see how much more we can do um, in, in the future. Um, I mean, it's been nice having kind of the ability to communicate directly with other members of the community. And even though we were kind of open to talking to other companies before, it's kind of like a explicit, like, you know, um, badge saying, hey, we're, we're, we're open to sharing, um, which is great. Um, we've already, I already had a couple of LinkedIn conversations with people in the community who were like, oh, hey, I see Airbnb is now a member of this community. Um, we'd love to talk more about communities. Um, so that, that's been great. Awesome. And um, another thing that I, uh, one of my last questions, actually, um, I know that Airbnb has been quite active uh, in outreach to the community, been provisioning uh, a lot of talks around how you set up your infrastructure, scale, deploying your application and so forth. And one of my questions is, how do you think end user organization can contribute and give back to the ecosystem? Do you have any best practices or maybe recommendations around this topic? So um, one of the great things is that uh, everyone, not just the core maintainers, can file uh, bugs, bug reports and, and patches as well, and, and even feature development. Uh, and so that's some of the things that we, we've been doing regularly. Uh, we also try to attend uh, you know, working groups and special interest groups to read design documents as they're, they're in progress. and. Uh, mention our, our use cases and, and requirements so that we can help motivate specific solutions. And then we can also um, discuss those extension points that I mentioned, which like, allow um, projects to be decoupled from you know, business specific logic or policy. And so this allows for um, you know, wider adoption of these, these projects and um, features I, it also allows uh, for uh, some of the maintainers to, to know which, which features uh, different companies are, are using. So they have a better idea of what to prioritize as well. Awesome. Sunil, any last thoughts on how end users can contribute back to the community? I, mean, I think, yeah, I think Stephen covers it pretty well. The, the big thing for us is really 
pushing code upstream as much as possible um, because we do run into some interesting edge cases with the projects we use um, just as the nature of our sort of scale and setup. Um, and I think it's helpful for us and also for everyone else to, to get you know, more eyes on our code and like to really upstream as much of this stuff as possible. Um, because, um, you know, it, it, it just reduces the maintenance overhead for us, but also really gives back to the community. So um, that's something we're, we're definitely trying to do more of um, in the next few years. Awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to all of your contributions, be it in, in code, be it in talks, being it outreach to the community. I think these are all great ways for everyone to, to reach out. And I think Airbnb is doing a great job of doing those so far. Now, these are pretty much all of my questions for both of you today. Thank you for everyone who joined uh, and listened to this stream um, from the CNCF End User Lounge. It was great to have Stephen Chan and Sunil Shah from Airbnb talking how they manage hundreds and thousands of services on dozens of clusters. Just as a reminder, we try to bring these uh, latest uh, cloud native end user stories on every fourth Thursday of the month at 9 a.m. PT. And another thing I'd like to mention is don't forget to join us for KubeCon and Cloud Native Con virtual, actually hybrid North America, which is going to be in October 12th to 15th. And if you'd like to showcase your usage of cloud native tools as an end user, you can join the end user community and you can find more details on the cncf.io forward slash end user. Thank you for joining us today and see you next time.